Hey, Thrilling Suspense fanatics, this is another story from Thrilling Suspense Fantasy, this time from the as-yet-unpublished third volume. If you would like this story in print, or to check out the other works, comics, and pulps in Thrilling Suspense Fantasy, follow the links in the description below. Citadel of the Slumbering God by R. Christopher Cornford. A terrible truth leered at Ser Simeon between lines of text, an implication that permeated all she read. It followed her out of the study, stalking her through the home she had inherited from her grandfather. It pestered her when she tried to sleep. It drove her to distraction when she went to the market. She could find no peace, not even in the simple joy of baking, and certainly not in any of her former passions. She no longer fenced, no longer ran, and had ceased playing Petrick with the other students when she finished her formal studies each day. Ser Simeon sat down Maraveshel's second chronicle on the desk before her and rubbed a slender hand against her throbbing temple. Another headache. Both eyes squeezed shut, she groped for her mug of root tea, and then the entire room shuddered and lurched, sending her mug flying from the desk. Wincing, she squinted over the edge to the wild stack of books that had multiplied in recent months. Damage was largely confined to an atlas of the kingdoms of Sun Children, which was open on top of the stack, a relief Sun children and their short, foolish lives couldn't be any less relevant to her now. Obligation be damned. She gathered the almanac and brought it by hall and staircase to the furnace room, interleaving soaked pages with absorbent sheets of finely woven kunyu wool before laying it open on the hot stones. No doubt her cousins were right. She had not adequately maintained the Sir Simmeral estate the gears had always run smoothly before, shifting silently as the dwelling moved along its labyrinthine circuit of Vanash with the rest of Azure Balam. Everything shuddered again, and this time Ser Simeon braced herself properly, readying herself for each of the familiar jolts and shocks. With each sudden jerk, lancing pain shot up from the base of her skull. Lines of Merevechel swam before her eyes. Terry continued older traditions in the founding of the Council of Five Cities, introducing a system to regulate the clockwork desert, but bringing instead the element of competition between the various houses that they might seek each other's knowledge in the mastery of the mechanical. Finally, the house came to a complete stop. Sir Simeon walked briskly to the kitchen and brewed another root tea. A few sips and the pain between her ears began to subside but there was never any time to relax. She finished her tea while reviewing schematics for the clockwork that connected her dwelling to the city of Azure Balam. Even distracted, she memorized diagrams nearly instantly. Ser Simeon replaced her house robes with a leather tunic and slacks, complementing them with sturdy gloves, magnetic boots, and goggles set with even rows of glowing crystals. With a nimbleness that spoke to her athletic past, Ser Simeon slipped through the trapdoor in the furnace room. She clambered along the connective coils of the machine. It was not difficult to locate the first spot of trouble. Gears bent out of shape made for the jerky movement. She fumbled for a hammer in her side bag, then pounded the offending gears back into shape, checking their geometry with calipers and compass intermittently. Before long, the gears were restored to her exacting satisfaction, and there it was, an axle out of true had, undeniably, over thousands of rotations, caused the damage to the gears. She followed the axle through a deep tunnel that took her to the eastern edge of Azure Balam, the stinging words of her cousins in mind. She passed through narrow piping in near total darkness, illuminated only by the crystals embedded in her goggles. She passed through great caverns lit by mushroom patches, crawling along the underside of the pipes by their pale glow, and all the while she followed the sound of clicking and occasional bangs and thuds. 
The axle culminated in a nest of gears and levers larger than her grandfather's home, receding below her into misty darkness. Dozens of other axles radiated out from the central machinery, a spinal column sending mechanical impulses across the vast, unknowable desert catacombs like some impossible body. It shuddered and clicked smoothly for a few minutes before violently clanking and grinding into relative position again. Gears were bent and cracked, axles out of their true position, spiral springs warped, wheels were ground unevenly, pillars askew, cords frayed, but the central axle, gears and mainspring, had not been too damaged. It should, no, it would be possible to fix everything, though it would take a great deal of time, and, undoubtedly, she would need to address the source of the problem, lest it occur again. The single-mindedness of her pursuit was a welcome respite from the leering lines of ancient text that pestered and gnawed at her in Azure Balaam. Ser Simeon crunched through dry rations before finding a cozy spot on a slow-turning cog. Methodically, she captured drops of moisture which gathered along the pipes, the resulting collection filtered by perforated charcoal in the top of her water skin. When the skin was near full again, she pressed it to her dry lips. It was fine to rest, she thought. After all, she'd traveled and worked what must have been close to a full sun cycle. And so, her mind working through schematics till the last second of consciousness, she fell to sleep. And when she slept, she dreamt of the great unknown expanse of Vanash, beyond the charted gears of Azure Balam, of Ulundwar, of Klesh, of Brilindurum, or Aethwalor. She dreamt of catacombs and machines whose purpose her readings barely hinted at. She dreamt of a nursery surrounded by piping, by metal tubes, by translucent vials with phosphorescent contents and at its center a great misty vat bristling with tubes, valves, knobs, and wires. Bubbles emerged from murky liquid and something stirred within it, though she could not make it out. Was this the truth her waking mind could not face directly? Sir Simeon awoke with a throbbing headache, the sort not even the root tea leaves she stuffed in her cheek could numb. Checking the gears around her, she calculated around seven hours of rest. Perfect. Probing her way around the partially memorized structure, she was a physician making a diagnosis. In the machine, she found purpose and clarity. She disengaged gears, decoupled fittings, tested connections, and began to isolate causal problems in her second day of labor. By the fourth day, Sir Simeon knew which axle to follow should she wish to locate the origin of the problem, and by the fifth matters were sufficiently under control that she felt ready to travel its length. At the very least, none of the remaining problems would damage Azur Balam during this rotation, but she reminded herself as her thoughts drifted home to her studies, the clockwork desert was never truly still it would only be a few years' time before Azir Balam rotated back through this sector, and who knows what sort of damage might occur before then. Or did she continue seeking to confirm her fears about Vanash? The comfortable separation, the diversion of her task, began to bleed into her suspicions. Sir Simeon followed the axle along many continuations through different clusters of gears until she knew she was beyond the limits of Azure Balam. When she was weary, she rested in a hammock mounted to specially fitted clamps, allowing her to sleep along the axle itself. She was careful, passing through Ulundwar, to respect the rites of repair observed by those in that more traditional and religious sister city. She carved the signs and burnt small offerings, as was prescribed. The Azur Balam Ulundwaran alliance had stood for centuries, but always seemed on the precipice of some falling out or other. 
This was certainly an unlicensed incursion deep into their mechanical territory, and could be construed as espionage by a magistrate so inclined. But she saw no one, and when she passed through the contested territory between Ulundwar and Brilindurum, she was relieved to see no one. Cave mites skittered along cables and axles around her, Lizards stalked stalactite ceilings, and she caught glimpses of a sea of beetle shells writhing below her when the passages grew narrower and her light carried far enough. Her rations ran out, and she hunted rats, moles, and even sucked the flesh from the carapaces of beetles when nothing else was available to her. She learned to avoid eating lizards whose meat sat poorly in her belly and made her travel much slower. She knew she traveled along the outskirts of Brilindurum by the distinctive incorporation of carapace fossils and plant growth along the exterior walls of their territory. The Brillin met only once every ten years to trade with the other cities of Vanash, ever concealing their faces behind expressionless masks and draping themselves in layer after layer of embroidered fabrics— a few times, her quest to fix and to mend took her beneath Brillin Commons, and it seemed to her, peeking from the shadows as she pressed ever forward, that the Brillin moved differently than men of other cities in Vanash, that perhaps their reclusive ways might hide some mutation, some aberration from the normal body structure, something having more joints than she did. But even here they wore masks and robes. She did not linger, and so learned little of their ways. Sir Simeon was relieved to follow her repairs beyond the weird men of Brilindurum. Soon she would travel past the edges of her knowledge, below the circulation routes that carried the five cities on the eternal circuit and into the very depths of prehistory. The farther she progressed, the more she relied on her own extrapolations rather than the words of Merveshil or Thelumon. Her need to repair and that elusive truth were one and the same, an all-encompassing passion which allowed her no time for other thoughts. She only remembered her past life intermittently and increasingly she saw herself in those memories as though through the eyes of another. Her cousin's words were as nothing to her, and what were their names again? The volumes piled high in the study of her inherited home did not call out any longer. What did she care for the Sun Children, or the stewardship of Van Ash? Greater mysteries awaited her, none greater than the terrible truth that seemed ever closer, yet ever just out of her reach. Yet the true purpose of the machine— it was this thought in particular which echoed at all times in her mind. The separation of the cities, the secrecy around the maintenance of the various great gears by the various orders, it all made sense as a way to blunt the nakedness of it. The men of Vanash were servants, only comprehending fragments of the vast complexity over which they presided in self-important ignorance. Knowing this was like shedding a skin, a layer of pretension which had always bothered her. So many foolish customs, irrational traditions, it confirmed the meaninglessness she felt in small talk, in the company of others, in the unending doldrums of Azure Balam society. She was free of the social bonds that had defined Ser Simeon Ser Simeral. She was alone. She knew when the first year had passed, but she did not know when the next had. Time was not so important. Rather, there was a rhythm, and she always kept rhythm. The rhythm of the hammer, tap, tap, tapping. The rhythm of the crank and the lever, of one hand in front of the other as she wormed along great braided coils, along axles, and leapt with precise timing between interlocking gears. And piece by piece, a grand design revealed itself to Ser Simeon. It was commonplace for her to anticipate whole sections of machinery, to isolate their slightest misalignments, and to engineer solutions to the most catastrophic malfunctions. 
Sir Simeon had noted the subtle shifts in design, in fabrication technique, in material of the components. There was a logic to it, a kind of shifting in complexity towards another purpose beyond cyclical movement. Clambering down a braided cable and easing herself onto a slowly turning gear, Sir Simeon winced at her physical deterioration. Her makeshift diet and constant work had left her stiff and thin, though her arms had thickened and knotted through constant climbing. She only thought of her body as an obstacle, its limits, its needs for nutrition and rest, its inability to exert torque along certain lines. She scuttled the length of a gear shaft, gripping the familiar contour of cool steel when her hand touched something hot. Recoiling, she nearly lost her balance, riding herself through gritted teeth. She slipped beetle-hide gloves again over calloused hands and discovered a forearm length, riveted iron pipe pushing unexpectedly from the steel shaft. Following it, she found the hot iron pipes let out into a vast chamber, the largest she'd seen since leaving Azure Balaam. Pipes led in from every angle, joining a central tree-like column. Mist and smoke hid details from her and made her eyes burn, but she could make out the continuous movement of mechanical parts through the haze. It was not sight, but sound that overtook her. The rhythms converged here, the churning machinery, the pumping of untold thousands of gears and pistons poured through her. This was the rhythm she had followed, the truth she had dreamed of, the heart of the machine. It pulsed and rocked her body, shaking her from her footing and pounding like another heartbeat through every fiber of her aching frame. The gaunt thing that was Sir Simeon scrabbled over the sea of hot metal. She often fell on slicks of oil and had to grab at pipes whose steaming exhaust scalded her and she coughed as the caustic vapors tore at her throat. Her gloves split, and beneath them her fingers bled and were cauterized by the burning metal. Interlocking gears ripped her clothing in smoldering strips. Her skin peeled and bubbled as jets of steam and smoke blasted over her, and only her goggles spared her from blindness, but even blindness could not have stopped her. She did not need sight to approach the central pillar. Every mechanical movement of the vastness of Vanash led here in a grand cycle beneath the clockwork desert. Mile after mile of desert shifting and turning as Vanash moved beneath it, a grand design of incomprehensible scope, a great song without discernible beginning or end. Bug-like, she scuttled up the base of the pillar, finding it easier to let gears, belts, and pistons move her. She simply needed to find the right moment to move from one to the next, and the rhythm would carry her. Through unbearable heat, her skeletal frame approached the top of the pillar, and she made out a vast mechanical canopy like the mirror image of churning mass over which she had crawled. Her body felt distant almost as removed as her memories of Azure Balaam. She saw herself shunted through a corrugated tube in the very center of the pillar, saw her ragged and bloodied body fold and break as it was pushed roughly over knots of wire and metal, and the thing that was Sir Simeon sensed more than saw or heard another threshold. She shucked the broken, twisted thing that had been Sir Simeon, letting its untenable pain fade from her, and as her body fell away, the cyclical musicality of the clockwork desert revealed itself as never before. She could see, as if from above the rotations of the desert, a Van Ash layered shifting beneath it, the workings of the five cities through the charted regions and beyond them, and, hazily, she could see the humming of the sun-children to the west of the vast desert, buzzing with incredible speed through their insignificant lives on the periphery of civilization. Refocusing her eyes, she watched her own progress through the catacombs of Van Ash, watched her growing facility with the mechanical repair, 
her dawning comprehension, and she saw before that, but simultaneous with it, herself kneeling before her grandfather's candlelit deathbed, cooling him with soaked rags. She saw herself as a child, a babe at her mother's breast, saw her mother and father making love. At this she refocused her eyes again. Another Sir Simeon, not the burnt carcass which stiffened as it lay crumpled and cooling on the stone floor behind her, but one whose body was hers and not hers, looked back from a polished metal surface. She was nude, her hair hanging midway down her chest. She was strong, more muscular than she remembered ever being, and somehow taller and less thin, a clean, strong hand raised up, from her muscular shoulder and pushed the reflective metal. It swung easily inward, revealing a gleaming staircase which twisted upwards into brilliant irresolution. Sir Simeon ascended the stair, and as she put her weight on each step, grew more accustomed to this body which was her own now. Carefully, ever so carefully, she controlled the movement of her eyes, the merest glance cast kaleidoscopic visions of time before her in disorienting waves. Only the path directly ahead was stable and had the look of the actual about it. And so she moved forward. The stair led out onto a pavilion of white stone under the bright sun of high noon, and instinctively she made to cover her eyes from that dangerous brilliance, and yet, Pain did not lance through her eyes as it should have. Blinking, she found she could see a vast sky above her, a deep azure at its center. Faint wisps of cloud curled lazily above gleaming turrets and towers of copper and marble. She stood in the midst of a city unlike any she had seen. Wondrous vessels sat atop regularly placed stone plinths around the pavilion, and a row of gnarled gray trees about her height erupted in blue thick leaves. White marble buildings with curved doorways spiraled out from all sides of the checkered stone tiles, some of them reaching skyward with towers inlaid with green copper. Behind her, the gleaming door swung to, shutting with a soft click in the copper hinges of a perfect slate cube. Sir Simeon was absolutely alone here, and she could feel it without knowing how exactly. Silence and stillness, and yet, underneath everything, the churning song of Van Esch. She listened less with her ears, and more to whatever sense perceived the motions of the clockwork desert below her. It was easier than seeing, and less blisteringly incomprehensible than the visions of her own life and the lives of others that threatened to stagger her every few steps. It was easier to let her eyes not look at anything in particular— or to focus on the sky, whose histories were incandescent beauty. The sound led her easily to a large, multi-domed building two stories tall. An arcade of columns supported arches at regular intervals along the stone wall, revealing an open courtyard within. Gentle curlicues of azure reflected from delicately cut, shallow pools, tracing their way to a central tower bristling with smoking chimneys. The curling smoke and dirty metal was a jarring contrast to the tranquil water garden. The song was louder as she approached, the bright clatter of machines echoing from the stone walls around her. She stepped into the shadowy arch of the tower, feeling the hot gusts of exhaust smelling oil, coal, and fire immediately. Blinking lights twinkled in indecipherable patterns from the darkness within. When she thought the daylight would extend no further, the floor lit below her. An orange glow followed her every step, illuminating dense clusters of piping and wire on all sides, Every angle, every bit of machinery joined a vat in the center of the tower. It extended upward into further machinery, a thousand more blinking mechanical eyes flickering in the pitch darkness above. She placed her palm on the glass surface of the vat, and it was warm to the touch. Something stirred, 
Bubbles rippled from and around a form in the murk, wires and tubes extending upward from its tenebrous mass. The song had its climax here, a clear development of the great pillar she had ascended to reach this strange city. From her hand radiated possibilities, variations of the song she had heard, and before her eyes came a wild, grand vision. Rectangular towers of glass and metal jutted from stone streets, and gleaming chariots of steel hurtled at impossible speeds, propelling themselves by some unknown fire. Steel birds full of sun-children ripped through the skies on rigid wings, and everywhere the sun-children built and built. Great masses of them worked like bees along conveyor belts to assemble, and some worked in more familiar ways, digging, hauling, demolishing. Unlike the visions of her past, and of other pasts and moments of the present, this was a futurity. Through this slumbering, submerged body, she was glimpsing the age of machines. Sir Simeon sat in darkness, the light from the floor panel fading with her stillness. Van Ash was the engine of history, capable of ushering in an age of prosperity and plenty the likes of which were beyond all ideation. All she need do is find the right time— the right moment to wake the slumberer, and its dream might be realized. She lay on the tile and closed her eyes, letting the song envelop her, sinking into its grand pattern. The End Well, thrilling suspense fanatics, now you have it. Some truly weird fiction to be published in Volume 3. And this tale is at the center of many other stories. The center of Van Ash, the center of the machine, and at the center of events which threaten to change the world of Merku forever. Remember to check the links in the description below to back my Kickstarter campaign for Thrilling Suspense Volume 3. We're unlocking stretch goals now. Take care and have a wonderful rest of your day.